I weigh 173 pounds. I bet each of you knows how much you weigh within five pounds. I would also guess that if I were to ask you how many items you own, the answer may not come quite as easily. As Adam mentioned earlier, we just moved to Maine about a year ago, and my wife and I were in the process of staging our apartment for sale. This process involved removing about a third of our items in order to make the tiny apartment seem larger and more broadly appealing. <laughs> I was like, how am I going to live with like, all this stuff gone? I'm a designer. I, all of these things are really important to me. Well, it turns out I didn't miss any of it. In fact, just the opposite. I was calmer in the space and prouder of the things in it. It felt like our home had lost weight. <laughs> As Adam mentioned, I'm a product designer and I use a human-centered design process. This involves interviewing people in their homes to gain empathy and understanding. It's through this process that I've become interested in what products people value and how they value them. So what exactly is it about products? Is there an optimum number of products to own to live a healthy lifestyle? <laughs> My wife and I just joined Amazon Prime. <laughs> For $79 a year, we get two-day shipping on our, our items for an entire year. Amazon's working on same-day shipping. It's never been more tempting or easier to buy. Amazon last year on Cyber Monday, November 26, sold 26.5 million items in a single day. That's 306 items per second. And as we buy more, our spaces grow. The average U.S. house in 1973 was 1,660 square feet. Today, 2,392 square feet, a 44% increase. And what happens when we run out of room for our things? We rent some. <laughs> the self-storage industry generated $22 billion last year. It's been the single fastest growing segment of commercial real estate for the last 35 years. Our economy and our political system are based on growth and profit not on health. We've created a culture of overconsumption. We each have a unique object fingerprint. This is a collection of objects that reflects who we are and who we want to be. It changes over time as things pass in and out of the object. I'd like to invite you, I have, I'd like to introduce a tool to you today, offer you a tool. It's a human-centered approach to optimizing our object fingerprint. It involves a shift in mindset from consumer to conductor. Consumer, the term, is a total insult. Zombies are consumers. We're human beings. Conductors, however, are responsible for directing a performance. We're all surrounded by a symphony of objects. We unify our things, we observe them critically, and we shape the collection. We need to see what our objects are offering us. Are they high in value or low in value? Nobody looks good in a headlamp. I use mine multiple times a day. I use it to change my baby's diaper at night, to go cross-country skiing in the dark, to read a book in bed. To me, functionality trumps vanity in this case. <laughs> High-value items are precious. Invest in them. Learn about their functionality, even read the manual if you have to. <laughs> I know it's a stretch, but try. 
take care of them so they're around for the long haul. One day this summer, I accidentally left my cheap portable speaker outside, and the next morning it was dead. So I decided I was going to go out and buy a better one that made both of my brother's speaker systems look like chump change. <laughs> After glowing on, I, I did some research based on glowing online reviews, two speakers, theirs only had one speaker, and a, a gorgeous design, I purchased these chill pill speakers. It took about a month of use, and it dawned on me that I had made a big mistake. The sound was kind of mediocre, but the thing that was a big, big pain was the cable management. I had to gang the speakers, like I had to pull one speaker out, attach it to another speaker, and then pull that speaker out and put it in the phone, listen to my music, and then when I was done, I had to pull one, blah, blah, blah. pain. And I think it takes a PhD to know how to recharge the things. I don't have that. So, out of desperation, I plugged my old speaker that had water damage in it back into my phone, and by some miracle, it worked. I was like, yes! <laughs> the chill pill speakers were dead to me. And that's when the chill pill speakers pulled the great trick that enables all low-value items to stick around far too long. It went quiet. We're connected to everything we own. It's through this bond that we give our items value. I have a strong bond to my headlamp. I use it often for long periods, and it's never let me down. We actually have a strong bond to high-value things, and it can be emotional. We nickname our cars. My brother's minivan is the White Pearl. <laughs> and we think of our friends and family when we use their gifts. I have a really weak bond to my chill pill speakers. I don't use them very much, and when I do, it's for short periods. And they make me feel like a sucker. Every time we interact with an object, we generate data. Both my parents are scientists, so I had to fit a graph in here somewhere. <laughs> this is a week's worth of interactions with my headlamp, chill pill speaker, and a hat that my mother knit me. This is incredibly useful data for me as a designer, for us as designers, because it gives us a broader view of our users' lives. We get to see all sorts of things like period of use, frequency, when it's being used during the day. Just as the term consumer is an insult to us as humans, the word stuff is an insult to our possessions. We spent in our entire lives am amassing these things, and they deserve some credit. Stuff is everything that falls below that value threshold line. Based on that, the headlamp can stay. The chill pill speaker clearly needs to go. But my mother's knit hat is a little bit more complicated. <laughs> it doesn't fit at all. It's, it's ugly. <laughs> but she made it with her own hands. <laughs> so I keep it. In this case, emotion trumps both vanity and function. <laughs> We're beta testing an app that enables you to rank the value of your items. Here's an example of how we might capture my headlamp and evaluate it. OK, we're not really building the software. <laughs> and the reason is all the information is already in our heads. We know what's a value and what isn't a value. So how do we use that? This is the second step in the journey, the purge step. It involves establishing the value threshold and breaking the bonds with low value items. This can be particularly difficult since these items once held such promise, but ultimately they haven't met our expectations. Now it's a, a, a hoarder would have a very low value threshold line, making everything within that house valuable. A minimalist line is really high. 
making very little worth keeping. Our line falls somewhere in the middle. So why bother purging? It's a giant pain, and it falls all on our shoulders as consumers, which is now a dated term, right? We're conductors. Well, let's think back to that story at the beginning about purging the apartment. What about that felt so liberating? Imagine you're a musical conductor and you have a violinist that refuses to play. How would that make you feel as a conductor? Distracted, probably stressed out, and it would reflect poorly on you and the group. If you couldn't get that violinist to play, you'd ask them to leave. That would put the focus back on the performing musicians. Well, it's the same thing with our possessions. By getting rid of stuff, we actually increase the value of the possessions we choose to keep. There's an art gallery or a museum effect that happens. Now it's time for follow through. A little door just opened up on that slide. It's probably hard to see. How do we get rid of stuff? Well, we've got actually quite a few options. We can sell it. We can donate it. We can loan it out. By the way, Canes and Belforts, thank you for all the kids' clothes. It's good stuff. Or we can recycle it. Wouldn't it be great for an extra $79 a year if Amazon took it back when we were done with it? <laughs> It's like, I'm so excited about that. I really wish they had that. <laughs> the third and final step in the journey is the purchase step. We aim to make high value purchases, but actually we don't really know until we get them home and experience them for a while. Those little floating, floating ball question marks, those could stay there or they could drop well below. Purchasing is a tricky thing because it's addictive. Shopping is gambling. It even produces the same neurotransmitter, dopamine, that's produced when gambling. Our culture is focused on this step of purchase. We need to buy to survive. We need to exercise some self-control and treat each of the steps equally. Prove, purge, and purchase. Flow in must equal flow out, otherwise we'll keep growing. There are two meanings in the definition of possession. The act or fact of possessing. <laughs> the state of being possessed. You have a choice to make. You can own your things or be owned by them. Marcel Proust once said, the real voyage of discovery is not in seeking new lands, but in seeing with new eyes. Thank you. <laughs>